Good morning, Christian family. Good morning. Good morning and welcome to our Easter service here at Christian Family Fellowship, GCI Jacksonville. We're so glad you decided to join us this morning. What a beautiful Easter Sunday morning God has given us. Amen? Amen. Yes, beautiful weather outside. We've got a wonderful praise and worship service for you this morning. A very special service on this day that we commemorate and remember the death and resurrection of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. What a wonderful day it is. Amen? Amen. 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 So we're going to start off our service this morning with our call to worship. Uh, those of you who feel like joining us by standing, please do so, but you, there's no requirement that you do, but we just do this as an opportunity to give honor to God. Amen? Amen. Amen. So Gwen, can you bring up my first video? Gwen. Bring up our first video. We're going to start off our services this morning with Worthy is the Lamb. Amen. <laughs> God is truly worthy of our praise. What a sacrifice that he gave us on that hill on Mount Calvary. Such a wonderful sacrifice. Let us all say, Thank you for the cross, Lord.
He is worthy to be praised. Amen. Amen. Yes, he is. Worthy is the Lamb. Continuing on with our program this morning, uh, we'll open up, continue with our opening worship prayer, followed with, with our praise and worship song set. So we had a little change in programming this morning, but it all works out for a wonderful opportunity to be in the Lord. Amen? Amen. 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 So as we prepare for our opening prayer, you know, there's so many needs that so many of us have, and as Pastor David will share with us on our praise reports and um, prayer requests, there is a big need. So please open up your hearts this morning. Let God's spirit come flowing through and have this renewal time with you this morning in the holy name of Jesus. So let us pray. Father God, we come to you this morning. We first and foremost give you thanks for this day. Thank you for this opportunity to be here on this Easter Resurrection Sunday where we commemorate the death and the resurrection of our Lord, your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. We come to you, Father, and ask that you would guide all that we do this morning. We pray, Father, that you will add a blessing to the message that is given this morning, to the songs that are sung, the prayers that are raised, the hearts that are open to receive you this morning, Father. We pray that you will fill our cup until it runs over. I will love you, O Lord, my strength. The Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer. My God, my strength, in whom I will trust. My shield and the horn of my salvation. Lord, you are my stronghold. I will call upon the name of the Lord, who is worthy to be praised. And so we ask, Lord, that this praise offering that we will be sending up to you this morning will be received. And we pray that you will add an anointing to the blessing that we receive. We thank you, Lord. We praise your name, O oh Lord. We thank you for your grace, and we thank you for your mercy. In the holy name of Jesus Christ, we do pray. Amen. All right, so we're going to continue on with our praise and worship song set. Now, if you get tired, <laughs> just sit down and just continue to join us in our praise and worship music. We have got some great music for you this morning, so I hope you will join in with us with our praise and worship song set. Our first song this morning Jesus, keep me near the cross. What a famous song. What a wonderful song. Jesus, keep me near the cross. There are precious mountains. Free to all the healing streams. Those from Calvary.
your soul shall find rest beyond the river. Amen. You know, Deborah uh, McCauley is our, our normal pianist. Poor thing, she came down with some stuff earlier this week and it's out on her back. So we love you, Deborah. We're praying for you. So we're going to do these songs in your honor as well. Our next song this morning, I believe, is uh, Because He Lives. You know, God died, sent his son to die for us so we can face tomorrow. Hallelujah. God sent his son. They called him Jesus. He came to love, heal, and forgive. They Oh, you. 
praise the Lord. Yes. You know, had it not been for the sacrifice of our Savior, we'd be in rough shape right now, y'all. <laughs> we wouldn't have a future to look forward to. A life with our Savior eternally. Amen. Amen. Our last song before we continue on with our program this morning. It's uh, one of my favorites, and I'm sure one of yours too. And it's by the Gaither, so I wanted to make sure that we included them this morning on this very, very beautiful rendition of I Believe in a Hill Called Mount Calvary, mm -hmm. after which Pastor David will come up and continue with our program for the rest of the morning. I Believe in a Hill Called Mount Calvary. I was going to have a lyrical video so you could read along, sing along with it, but I pushed the wrong button. But it was a wonderful song anyway. Hallelujah. Let's give God praise for I Believe in a Hill Called Mount Calvary. Pastor Davey is coming up next. If you're visiting with us today, we hope you received a monogram pin and a welcome card. Please uh, feel free to share any contact information you would like so that we can keep you posted on upcoming church events and place it loosely in the offering basket when that comes around. Take a good look at your bulletin today on this Easter Sunday. 
be up to date on all the activities coming up. You'll see there's a youth camp registration coming up. We have the forms today. If you want to express interest in youth camp or you think your child might like to come to our youth camp, then please fill out the form and give it to the info table today. It's not a commitment at this point, but it just gives you gives us a general idea as we start to calculate our preteens and kids that are coming. If I could have one of the ushers come up. If you would like to know more about the youth camp in June, just raise your hand and James will bring you a copy. We have a baby dedication coming up today. As soon as uh, my daughter Amanda gets here, she is a very doting mother and takes her a while to get all the kids out of the house. But she will be here shortly. We're going to dedicate the latest of the baby basketball team. We now have five grandsons. We have a team. <laughs> I always wish, though, one of them would have a girl. I think I've done this moaning to you before so that my daughters would realize how hard it is to raise a girl. Amen. Our offering scripture, and by the way, it's so good to see uh, Don and Donna feeling a little better, well enough to come today. Uh, Steve has his lung reduction surgery this week. Keep him in prayer. If you have a prayer need to share with us today, please put the prayer slip loosely in the offering basket that's attached to your bulletin, and we will pray for you today and throughout the week. Our offering scripture is taken from one of our readings this week, Acts chapter 4. All the believers, when Jesus started the church, all the believers that, that had come to Jerusalem, they, they were of one heart and mind, and no one claimed that any of their possessions was their own. They shared everything they had. Now, that's not something the Bible says you have to do every day. But they were so dedicated to the Lord, and they had come there from all around the Mediterranean Sea, all other countries, and they didn't want to go back. And so they were running out of food and supplies. And so everybody just shared with each other for whatever time they remained in Jerusalem. And with great power, the apostles continued to testify. Look what they were preaching the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, which is what we celebrate today. Their message focused on the death and resurrection of Jesus. And God's grace was so powerfully at work in them, all that there were there, there were no needy persons among them. The application for our offering, believing that Jesus is alive, when somebody preaches the resurrection, it definitely changes our heart towards sharing, doesn't it? So as we give an offering today, if you need an envelope, please raise your hand and one of the ushers will bring one to you. And we're just glad you offered yourself. This may not be your week to give an offering, but we're just glad you've offered yourself to be here. And we do thank you, the, those of you who are able to give an offering. It de definitely helps us meet our budget, and we appreciate that. During the giving of the offering, we will have offering music by the Voices of Praise Choir.
Jerusalem, the new Amen. Jerusalem, will come down from heaven, and the tabernacle of God will be with men forever and Amen. ever. Amen. Let us dedicate this offering to the Lord and bring our prayers to him. Let us pray. Our Father in heaven, we lift up this offering to dedicate it to the work of Jesus Christ, and we thank you for the privilege we have to participate with Jesus here in Christian Family Fellowship of Grace Communion. We just ask your blessing upon this offering. We give it to you, Lord, sincerely and willingly. 
And we bring our prayer needs today. We thank you so much that Don and Donna are feeling well enough to be here with us. And continue to pray, lift up in prayer, Donna, and her health needs, Lord, her lower back surgery coming up and she's having some and be coming up in the morning and we pray that it will be successful Lord she needs your intervention your miracles we lift up Steve who will be having lung reduction surgery on Wednesday we pray for his healing we pray for success in that surgery we lift up our brother Malik who is here with us today Lord it's been a year since he was shot his right arm, his right hand is still not very usable. Lord, he needs a miracle. We ask you for this miracle for Malik to bring back the, the full use of his, his body. We know you can do it, and we trust you, Lord. We lift up in prayer Lori Mulhall at this time, at the passing of her husband, Pat, this past Wednesday. We just ask that you continue to give her the courage and strength that she needs at this time. And thank you, Father, that you've helped her right along so far. We are grateful. We are grateful for Linda's knee surgery that went well on Wednesday. We pray for her full and, and steady recovery, that you encourage her and bless her. Lord, we're just so grateful to bring all our prayer needs to you. We're so grateful to offer to you as an act of worship, and we commit it all to you in prayer in Jesus' name, amen. We're now going to have the youth scripture reading in just a moment. As soon as you guys are ready, we'll skip ahead from the baby dedication. I don't think Amanda's here quite yet, is she? She will be soon. So the youth scripture reading from one of our readings in the Psalms this week will be brought to us by Bradley Vess. Today's scripture reading comes from the book of Psalms, chapter 118, verses 14 through 24. The Lord is my strength and my defense. He has become my salvation. Shouts of joy and victory resound in the tents of righteousness. The Lord's right hand has done mighty things. The Lord's right hand is lifted high. The Lord's right hand has done mighty things. I will not die but live and will proclaim what the Lord has done. The Lord has chastened me severely, but he has not given me over to death. Open for me the gates of righteousness. I will enter and give thanks to the Lord. This is the gate of the Lord through which the righteousness may enter. I will give you thanks for you answered me. You have become my salvation. The stones the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. The Lord has done this and it is marvelous in our eyes. The Lord has done it this very day. Let us rejoice today and be glad. May the Lord add a blessing. Let us rejoice and be glad. We do not have a teen Bible study today. The teens will be in here for the message. But the preteens, those are children age uh, 10 through 6 or 11, if you feel young, are welcome to dismiss now to the children's church classroom for your lesson. And I believe they're going to have some activities for you as well during the lesson, some Easter activities. And when Amanda gets here, at the end of the sermon, we'll come get you, uh, and my wife, Yvonne, any others that are want to come out for the dedication of the baby. Our sermon title today, Eat, Drink, and Be Merry, and Die. What? Who put that up there? Have you ever heard that expression, eat, drink, and be merry? Is there anything wrong with that? And what does that have to do with the resurrection of Jesus? It actually is 
partially quoted in the New, New Testament having to do with the resurrection of Jesus. Our teenagers are in here today. I'm not going to ask them to comment out loud, but I want you to think for a minute, teenagers, what is your favorite food? And you know, if you ever want to get a teenager talking, and even a lot of adults, just ask them, what's your favorite food? We all like to share our favorite food. We love to eat. What a blessing that God made food to eat. Or to talk about your favorite restaurant. It is a pleasure and a blessing God created that we can eat and enjoy. But for some people, eat, drink, and be merry is all there is to their life because they don't understand that there is a life beyond now. The expression, let me read to you from Wikipedia a little bit about this expression. Eat, drink, and be merry. Is this a biblical concept? The phrase, eat, drink, and be merry, or eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow we die, has been used for centuries. That's been around a long time, even before good food like we have today and good restaurants. Usually this phrase is understood as enjoy life as much as possible because we won't live forever. Enjoy it now because this is all you get. While the phrase's wording is an amalgamation of several verses in the Bible, including Isaiah 22 and Ecclesiastes 8 and 1 Corinthians 15 and Luke 12, the underlying principle is quite the opposite from biblical teaching. Turn with me to the book of 1 Corinthians 15 as we read today about the resurrection of Jesus and what it has to do with eating, Drinking and being merry. I hope you're merry today. This is a day of celebration. We celebrate the birth of, of the resurrection of Jesus, that he is alive, and it's a wonderful thing to celebrate. When we do celebrate the birth of Jesus on Christmas, we often say, Merry Christmas. Are you merry? Happy Easter. Are you happy? Paul wrote about this. He said in chapter 15 of 1 Corinthians, Now, brothers and sisters, I want to remind you of the gospel I preach to you which you received, and on which you have taken your stand. I hope you take a stand for your faith. The world is bringing pressure on you to deny your faith, to compromise your faith. Take a stand for what's right. And by this gospel, you are, if you hold firmly to the word I preach to you, so what's that gospel about? This gospel makes a difference in our salvation if you hold on. Otherwise, you have believed in vain. The next verse says, for what I received, now he sums up the gospel. What I received I passed on to you as of first importance. This is what's most important, the nucleus of the gospel. That Christ died for our sins according to the scripture. Now that alone is important to remember because there are a lot of folks today, even in the Christian world, that think it hurts people's feelings to tell them that Christ had to die for your sins. And can we even avoid sometimes using that term? And, but the Bible doesn't avoid using it. And certainly it can be used to beat people over the head in the way that God didn't intend. But it's important to remember Christ died for our sins. And the communion we will share today reminds us that we are sinners. We need his death and resurrection. So the nucleus of the gospel, of first importance, Christ died for our sins as prophesied in the scripture. He was buried and that he was raised on the third day and that's what we celebrate today. On that third day, he was raised to life according to the scripture, and that he appeared to Cephas, which is another name for the apostle Peter. He appeared to the 12, which is a reference of the 12 disciples, 12 apostles. And after that, he appeared to more than 500. I wish I knew who those 500 were. You know, it's interesting. You don't read about that anywhere else in the Bible, but they knew about it. 
500 people saw Jesus resurrected, brothers and sisters, most of whom are still living. Paul wouldn't make that up when all those people were still living. Besides, he's speaking and writing under the inspiration of the Spirit of God. And after that, he appeared to more than 500 brothers and sisters, most of whom are still living at the same time, though some have died or fallen asleep. Next verse. And then he appeared to James and then to all the apostles. So by now, there were more apostles than just the original ones. And then he appeared to all of them. And last of all, Paul says, he appeared to me as to one abnormally born. 1 Corinthians 15 is called the resurrection chapter. It starts off with the facts that the nucleus of the gospel is that Jesus died for our sins, that he was buried, and that he was raised again. The nucleus of the gospel. But if it has been preached that Jesus or Christ has been raised from the dead, how are some of you saying that there is no resurrection of the dead. Do you believe there's no resurrection of the dead? Do you go to a funeral and just think that's it, it's over, we'll never see them again? There were some people in the church in those days who didn't really believe in a resurrection, but the Bible teaches it is a reality to come. If there is no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, our preaching is useless. And so is your faith. If the tomb pictured in this cardboard cutout, if the tomb of Jesus were not empty because he had been raised and resurrected, your faith is in vain. You're wasting your time thinking you're going to live forever through Jesus Christ. But you're here today because you do believe that Jesus has come out of the grave. The Roman soldiers went around telling the story, we fell asleep, and his disciples stole him out of the tomb. They told that story because the leaders of the Jewish nation at that time were jealous of Jesus, and they didn't want anybody to believe he had been resurrected. And they paid money to the Roman soldiers, tell them you were asleep. And the disciples came and took him out. That's why the tomb is empty. But the tomb is empty because Jesus is alive. If there is no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, our preaching is useless and so is your faith. More than that, we are then found to be false witnesses of God. For we have testified about God that he raised Christ from the dead, but if he he did not raise him if, in fact, the dead are not raised. If there's no resurrection, then don't believe Jesus was resurrected. For if the dead are not raised, then Christ has not been raised either. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile. And you are and I am still in my sins. If this is just a fairy tale, then your future life is a fairy tale too. But it's not a fairy tale. It's so real. And you know the presence of Jesus in your life. You know he's alive. If Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile. You're still in your sins. And then those also who have fallen asleep in Christ are lost. If only for this life we have hope in Christ, we are of all people most to be pitied. Why did Paul say that? He said, Christians are to be pitied if your only hope is for this life. Now, we're going to look at a scripture in a minute that tells us that the Christian life is profitable for right now and for the future. It is the right way to live, the good way to live. It is the blessed way to live. You don't have to look over your shoulder wondering what bad deed is going to catch up with you next. It is the best way to live, and it treats other people the right way. Shows love to all, including love to yourself, without being selfish, hurting others. It's the best way, but Paul's 
letter was given to the church during a time of persecution and distress. They were being persecuted. They were being harassed by the Jewish nation, by the Roman Empire, by other religious people with other views about pagan gods. And he's saying if, if you're suffering all these things for nothing, for something that's not true, then we, we are to be most pitied because they were suffering persecution and so was Paul. And he'll talk about it in a second. If only for this life we have hope in Christ. If you don't have hope for the future life, then you're going to be really, really disappointed if Christ wasn't real and true. But he is real and true. He is alive. And so you're not going to be disappointed. Eat, drink, and be merry, we read, and then die. I say to you today, brothers and sisters, you and I can eat, drink, and be merry to the glory of God. And then we will live forever. The next verse says, but Christ has indeed be re been raised from the dead. The first fruits of those who have fallen asleep, he's the first to be resurrected to eternal life. The next verse tells us, that we skip a few. Paul said now about why the, he was suffering and why that suffering would make him to be most pitied if he was doing it for nothing. I face death every day, Paul said, yes, just as surely as I boast about you in Christ Jesus our Lord. I've, if I have fought wild beasts in Ephesus with no more than human hope, see, they cast him into the arena with wild beasts on one occasion to try to kill him. He said, if I did that for nothing, what have I gained? If it was just for human hope, what have I gained if the dead are not raised? Let us eat and drink, for tomorrow we die. And there's that scripture, that phrase. And he's actually quoting from the book of Isaiah where God sent a message through the prophet Isaiah to the Jewish nation, and he said that if you don't turn away from your sins, then bad things are going to happen to you, and you're living, you're saying this. That nation was saying this, let us just eat and drink for tomorrow we die. There's no hope beyond this life. That's a sad place to be, isn't it? That is a sad place to be. Let us eat and drink for tomorrow we die. This is it. We have nothing else. Don't be misled. Bad company corrupts good character. He said, don't fall for that. Don't live that lifestyle. Because if you hang around Negative people, people who are a bad influence on you, it will corrupt you. Now, Jesus did eat with sinners. We are to mix as Christians with the world, with folks, but we're not to compromise our values and to hang around them so much that we start to get corrupted. He says, come back to your senses. Come back to your senses as you ought. Stop sinning. For there are some of you who are ignorant of God, and I say this to your shame. Hmm. Eat, drink, and be merry. He doesn't say be merry. The literature people added that. For tomorrow we die. I was watching a movie the other day. Maybe you've read this book in school. Did you ever have to read um, any Ernest Hemingway? Um, some of his stuff, you know, is, is very uh, cynical and um, not real uplifting. I always enjoyed, though, The Old Man in the Sea. Any of you ever read or watch that movie, The Old Man in the Sea by Hemingway? He wrote another book called The Sun Also Rises, and they made a movie about it in the late 50s or early 60s. I was watching the color version of that. I think they added the color. And they said that the people after World War I were known as the lost generation. Did you ever hear about that? They, they were called the lost generation because there had been so much devastation after World War I and so much heartbreak. And by some estimates, 40 million people died, either in the war or results of the 
disease and starvation and other things associated with the war. 40 million people. And you know what happened to folks? They lost their faith in God. How could God allow that to happen in their hearts and their minds? And you can understand them feeling that way, but they didn't make the right choice. They chose to be unbelievers. And little by little, and then followed by World War II, Europe became more and more a land of not really valuing Christianity, not, not like we have been able to do in the United States, although we're drifting away too as a country. But they were the lost generation, and, and Hemingway wrote this story, The Sun Also Rises, to point out that in Europe, after World War I, it was like the sunset. It was like a time of darkness. And they said that people had an attitude, oh, we're just born to die young. That's, that's what you, you thought. We, we were just born to die young, the lost generation. And Hemingway wrote this story, which was a bit negative himself, about a man who had been over in Europe in the war, or maybe in the Pacific, uh, I think it was Europe, and it, he had been injured to where he couldn't get married, but he was in love, and this woman was in love with him, and they were trying to deal with that. And the, the title really struck me, The Sun Also Rises, because in your life there are many times a sunset, there are many times of sunset. There are many times of darkness. There are many times when things don't go well, and you've got to remember, I'm not going to be the lost generation. The sun may have set in my life in some ways, but don't forget, there is a new day tomorrow, and the sun will rise. And as I thought of that, I thought, you know, in the Bible you read about how Jesus is called the day dawn and the morning star. In the book of Daniel, it says, um, upon you the sun of righteousness will, will shine, calling the Lord the sun, S-U-N, of righteousness. God doesn't want us to worship the sun, but on a few occasions in the scripture, he actually makes an analogy that Jesus is like the sunrise. He's like that dawn that dawn of a new day. And when you give your life to Jesus, it is a new day and a new life and a new dawn. And I'd like to change that title of Hemingway's book, the S-U-N also rises to remind you, the sun, S-O-N, also rises. And that Jesus Christ has risen from the grave. And your tomorrow and my tomorrow doesn't have to be the life of the lost generation. We don't have to be the folks who say, there's no hope. Let me eat and drink for tomorrow we die. God wants us to be happy, joyful, to eat and drink, enjoy our lives. But he wants us to do it to the glory of God. Every good thing God made can be used in a wrong way or probably most things, maybe all things. Love, marriage, sex, so many ways people use it wrongly, right? Food, nature, so many ways people can use it wrongly. Prosperity, blessings, people can use those wrong, and sometimes we do. Look at this scripture in the book of Timothy. Because Paul said, as a Christian who's under persecution, we are like pitiful people if we only have hope in this life, but we have hope beyond this life. And so he wrote to Timothy, he said, I want you to point these things out to the brothers and sisters, and if you do, you'll be a good minister of Christ Jesus, nourished on the truths and the faith of the good teaching that you have followed have nothing to do with godless myths and old wives' tales because the women didn't get out as much in those days. They were more often, you know, restricted to just the home environment. And, and so I guess they, they made up some stories. 
keep things interesting. Not that men ever made up anything. Don't follow these old wives' tales. Rather, train yourself to be godly. For physical training is of some value, but godliness has value for all things. Holding promise. Get this. If I could bend that over, I would. You need to see that. But I like that there. I put it there. Physical training is of some value, but godliness has value for all things. And catch this. Holding promise for both the present life and the life to come. I would rather live no other way than the Christian way. All the joy and happiness in my life has come since I turned to Christ and chose him and his way. And almost all the problems in my life can be traced back to either me sinning or somebody sinning impacting me and hurting me because of their sin. But if you live for Christ and you commit yourself to him, your life will be better. It will be. And if you don't believe that, then you're probably not believing Christ. And if you're not believing Christ, then you have no hope. And if you have no hope, then maybe you should just eat, drink, and be merry because tomorrow it's all over. Just live for pleasure. Now, I'm not recommending that. Because it only takes about one day living for pleasure to mess up your life. Do you know what they call it, living for pleasure? There's a word for that. Hedonism. Hedonism. You ever heard of hedonism? You young folks out there, have you ever heard that word hedonism? I'm going to read the definition of hedonism to you from Wikipedia. Hedonism. It's spelled like this. H-E-D-O-N-I-S-M. Does this describe me or you? Hedonism refers to the prioritization of pleasure in one's lifestyle, actions, or thoughts. The term can include a number of theories or practices in philosophy, art, and psychology, encompassing both the sensory pleasure and more intellectual or personal pursuits, but can also be used in everyday parlance, parlance as a pejorative for the egoistic pursuit of short-term gratification at the expense of others. The term originates in ethical philosophy, where value hedonism is the claim that pleasure is the sole form of intrinsic value. Normative or ethical hedonism claims that pursuing pleasure and avoiding pain for oneself or others are the ultimate expressions of ethical good. Pursuing pleasure is the ultimate expression of ethics. Somehow it doesn't seem to work out that way, does it? People pursue pleasure, they don't seem to act very ethical toward others. Now, is that your lifestyle, hedonism? Are you living as if there is no resurrected Christ? Are we making choices as if Christ really isn't alive and that we really have no future? Because remember what Paul said. He said, this is the crux of the gospel that Jesus died for our sins, was buried, and was resurrected. And you will be saved by that if you hold fast to that. But if we go into hedonism, living for pleasure, eat, drink, and be married, or tomorrow we die, what we're really saying is I'm not really so sure that there is life after this life. And brothers and sisters, if there is no life after this life, the whole world is in a horrible, horrible shape and mess. But th there is. Because Christ is resurrected, we have 
life forever in the future. And no matter how the sun sets in our week or our days from time to time, the Son of God has also risen. And he has given you and me a new life, a real life, a future life. And we can enjoy and have that pleasant life even now in Christ. But most of all, for all eternity, because the pursuit of pleasure can keep you out of eternity. And like Jesus said, what do I gain if I gain everything in this world but I lose my soul. Forever is a long, long time, but this little life is not that long. But while you live this life, live it to the glory of Christ, to the glory of God. Eat, drink, have some merry times, but all within the ways of Jesus, of love for others. Tomorrow, one day, we will die. But if we're living for Jesus, we will be resurrected just as he has been resurrected. Our spirit returns to God who gave it. And then Jesus returns one day, and we all get a new body and are resurrected for all eternity. And we'll live forever and ever and ever because the Son of God truly rises. Amen. Let us pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you for rising in our life, for being our day dawn, our day star, our son of righteousness. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for the new life we see in springtime all around us, reminding us that we have new life in Christ. We're so grateful to you for it. We thank you for it, Lord. We ask that you would guide us to live as men and women who believe the gospel and hold it fast and stand fast. We give you praise and thanks that you, Jesus, are alive, that you, Father, has sent your only Son to die for our sins, to be buried, to be raised again the third day, that all might live. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Well, we are going to have a communion shortly, but we're going to have the um, baby dedication before that, unless you need more time to get ready. Are you guys ready? Was that a yes? All right, let's put up on the screen the purple banner, the dedication celebration for Max Jensen Larson and family, Rick, Amanda, Xavier, and Axel, Easter Sunday, March 31st. Amanda and Rick have three boys, Xavier, who we call X sometimes, Axel, who we call Ax, and Max, who we call Max. So we've got X, Ax, and Max, the uh, X brothers. And um, Kim, would you let my wife know that we're about to have the, she's in the children's classroom, let her know we're about to have the dedication of Max. And I want to invite up um, to the front, to the tre trellis, trestle, the Larson family, as many of you that want to come up, and um, any of the grandparents. And we are going to bless and dedicate Baby Max, who's about three weeks old. Now let's bring up the scriptures that we're going to read. And see if we can blow them up a little bit eventually. To be able to create life is an amazing thing, isn't it? I still miss Eva Mormon, who passed at, I think, 101, close to it, either just before it or just before 102. And she, uh, she had 17 children, Miss Eva did, out of one body. Can you believe that? 
I'd like to know what she was eating and drinking. And so we have um, three children in the Larson family, and we're going to read a couple of scriptures about the dedication and blessing. As you see on the screen, I'll read from my folder. Our children are God's creation. They belong to him as symbolized in the Old Testament dedications at the temple. But we are privileged to be a part of developing and forming them for his purposes and glory. Our Heavenly Father's greatest purpose for them is to bless them with eternal life and love with him as Father, Son, and Spirit. To be his children forever. To accomplish this purpose, Jesus, the Son of God, was determined to die for them and for all mankind from the beginning of the world. In Luke 18, Jesus blessed the children. Some people were even bringing infants to Jesus so that he might touch them. But when the disciples saw it, they rebuked them. But Jesus, however, invited them and he said, Let the little children come to me and don't stop them because the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. And in Mark chapter 10, he said, he took them into his arms and laid his hands on them and blessed them. The last verse, Rick and Amanda, applies to you and your obligations before God. It says in Ephesians chapter 6, Children, obey your parents, for this is right. Honor your father and mother, the first commandment with promise, that it may go well with you and that you may live long in the, in the land. But fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. So that's a, a challenging job that we all have. I want to invite Rick and Amanda, one of you, to light the candle over here. And let's have you guys stand by the table. Be sure this is working. To light a candle of commitment that you will bring the light of Jesus into the lives of your children and baby Max. Jesus is the light, the true light. And symbolically, we light this candle of the parents' commitment to bring the light of Jesus into the life of Max. And now we're going to have a prayer of blessing upon Max. We're going to symbolically anoint his head with oil to set him apart for the Lord. Let us pray. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for the life of Max. We thank you for his precious family that is going to raise him in the nurture and teaching of the Lord. We set him apart now, laying hands upon him, anointing him with oil, to be for your glory, to be in your family forever. We pray that you will reveal yourself to him through Jesus Christ, that he may have eternal life. We ask a blessing of protection, safety, Opportunities being taken care of in every good way, good health, healing when he needs it, that your angels may be about him to keep him safe, to let him grow to maturity, to know you and to know Jesus and to live forever with his family. And we just thank you for it and ask all your blessings upon him, dedicating him to you. In Jesus' name, we pray for the parents that you would guide them in every way that they need your guidance and strength. In Christ we pray, amen. I present to you Max. So um, it would be nice if we got one picture there. Does anybody have a camera? Oh, Judy, okay, you got a picture, good. 
All right. And, well, you guys are uh, welcome to go back to your seats. By the way, we're going to set up the picture portrait background over here on the wall after church. So if you want to have a picture of your family dressed for Easter or just all being here together, it will be a great opportunity to do so after church today. You know, Easter is about new life, and you just saw the newest human life right up here on stage. My wife and I were told long ago in the book of Genesis, be fruitful and multiply. And so far, we have uh, been responsible for eight people. That's pretty good, isn't it? We were fruitful and multiplied. Our three kids and their five kids. Well, now as we close this Easter service, we are going to share communion together. If I could have my usher come forward and uncover the elements. And we invite all of you who believe in Jesus as your Savior and have trusted your lives to him to partake of the communion today. And maybe if you're someone who have, hasn't yet dedicated your life to Jesus we welcome you to take of the communion today, maybe for the first time with that intent that you intend to, to truly follow Jesus in your life. In the scripture, Jesus spoke about the fruit of the vine. We have grape, grape juice and wine. Grape juice is in the center of the tray. Wine is a little lighter colored. It's in the perimeter of the tray. And we're going to come up to the table in just a few minutes. But before then, if you need to be served at your seat because of mobility issues, um, Nia will bring the elements around to your seat. Just raise your hand if it, Nia and Vic will take them to you. And just hold on to them until we're all ready to participate together. I have two communion scriptures today. Luke 24. The men said to the women when they came to the tomb, the angels why are you looking for a living person here? This is a place for the dead. Jesus is not here. He has risen from the dead. You know what a place of the dead is? A graveyard, right? A cemetery. When Judas betrayed Jesus, he went to the Pharisees and Sadducees, and they gave him 30 pieces of silver to betray Jesus. When he saw that Jesus was condemned to die, he regretted what he did, and he went and hung himself. And then as he was hanging, he fell down, and his stomach burst open. Judas' money, he tried to give it back to the priests and Sadducees and Pharisees. They said, we can't take that money. It's blood money. And you know what they did with it? They bought a cemetery. They took the money that was paid for the blood of Jesus and they bought a field to bury people, the field of blood. And though it may not have ever been intended that way, it's sort of an interesting foretelling of the fact that it is the blood of Jesus that is needed in every cemetery it is the blood of Jesus that every cemetery that you see around this world and all the dead bodies underneath them, in a sense, are fields of blood, fields, cemeteries of people that Jesus shed his blood for. And many of them already know Jesus and will rise at that resurrection and at the last trumpet so as we take of the communion today, let us remember that Jesus' blood covers cemeteries. Jesus' blood covers the dead, and that the dead will one day rise just as Jesus did. And this communion before us today is the blood, represents the blood of Jesus Christ shed for our sins as we read. Let us pray. Lord Jesus, we come before you. We stand in awe of the fact that you offered yourself on the cross, that you bled and died to buy my
my pardon. And that the money given to betray you was spent to buy what's called a field of blood. Because your blood truly covers all who have died who trust in you in every cemetery. And you died for all, even those who don't trust you. You love them. You died for them. We thank you, Lord Jesus, for giving your life, your blood, your body for us. And I ask, we ask your blessing upon this communion. In your name we pray. Amen. And so if you need to be served at your seat, please just raise a little hand and the ushers will bring it over to you. And once you have yours, we're going to start the communion music and we'll all stand and We'll come forward from the back row and in each succeeding row down the middle. Take the elements back around the perimeter to your seat, and then we shall all partake together. It's such a pleasure to take of the body and blood of Jesus together with you today, brothers and sisters, believers in Jesus Christ. Lord, I wrote stand. this back in 1963, back when your mom and daddy were just courting, right? Just courting. The body and blood of Jesus Christ given for us. resurrected Jesus Christ has touched our lives and welcome you to to prepare the bread you may take it either sitting or standing and remember the words of Jesus this is my body which is broken for you yes take and eat and then he gave thanks Lord Jesus we give you thanks for all that you endured because you love us and you touch our lives we thank you for this bread is the body of Jesus Christ. 
In your name we pray, amen. Let us take of the bread. Potter's field was a field of blood. It was purchased by the money that paid to have Jesus killed. Because the true blood of Jesus would be shed upon all who have died and live if they will receive him. As you take of the cup in a few moments, recall that you have entered into a covenant with Jesus. You believe in his sacrifice for you, that he died for your sins. He called it the blood of the covenant, shed for the remission of sins. And then he gave thanks. Lord Jesus, we thank you for shedding your blood, that our sins may be wiped away. We thank you for the new covenant in your blood. And ask your blessing upon this communion and upon this fruit of the vine to be as your blood. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Let us take of the cup, the blood of Jesus shed for you and me. We're going to conclude with a song of praise and a benediction reading by Elder Ken Pennix. Let the church say amen. Yeah. Amen. What a wonderful opportunity it is to share in this communion exercise. It gives us an opportunity to renew our covenant with our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, God our Father. Amen. Amen. We've got one last song that we'd like to uh, share with you. For those who feel like standing, please join us as we sing, Jesus is our all and all, everything, all things, 100% of what we are. Amen. Amen. Okay, you can check. You are my strength when I am weak. You are the treasure that I seek. You are my all in all. Seeking you as the precious jewel. Lord, to give up, I'd be a fool. You are my all in all. Worthy 
name of Jesus Christ, our Savior, our salvation. Hallelujah. Give God glory, everyone. We praise your holy name, O Lord. Our benediction scripture comes from the first Corinthians chapter 15, verses 55 and 57. Please join me as we read our benediction scripture. Where, O death, is your victory? Where, O death, is your sting? But thanks be to God, he gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Amen. I have, I have hopes that the Holy Spirit has touched your heart in some special way. And I pray that the Holy Spirit is with you every single moment that you are alive. <laughs> we never should leave home without the power of the Lord with us. Amen. So if you, if you require prayer, we'd be happy to pray for you after services. If you need an anointing, we'll be happy to do that as well. If you're looking to start your journey with Christ, you, you can never pick a better day than today. So if you're looking for a church home or if you're looking for a Savior, we can help you on that path. Amen? Amen. Amen. So I hope that you have a wonderful rest of the day plan with family and friends. But remember... Jesus is our Lord, and he has risen, and we are so happy that he is here. Amen. Amen. We are dismissed. Thank you for being here. Oh, Jesus.